you very much for the invitation this evening, and may I have all of your promises to participate, and make this uh, lively. <laughs> I have lots of experience not being discriminated against, but encountering ageism and other kinds of discrimination among candidates I represent to clients. So I get it. And I think I will convince you that I get it this evening. You'll also find me among the subspecies called recruiters. I am much more candidate centric than most. However, I don't come from the pure software development developer world. I help make software code make sense to users. Sometimes those users are software developers, but I'm nowhere near as technical as you guys. So forgive me in advance. As Greg mentioned, this is the table of contents. Okay, we'll skip through it. Some acronyms first. Technology worker. HT is hiring team, and OC is older candidate. Let's define some terms. What is an older candidate? Any guesses? Any points of view to share? Somebody Google doesn't look at? Yep. <laughs> Good. Okay. Could we put a, a an age to that? 30? 33? Somebody older than the hiring manager. Older than the hiring manager. That's a good one. I like that. 45? Okay. She will say a tech writer. Uh, tell me. The program to COBOL at <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that qualifies. Good, good. Okay. Any other data points? At what age in Silicon Valley did you start feeling old? Um, don't answer. Okay. So I'm going to just say 40 for software developers starts starts be raising eyebrows, and in the tech writing world. We have it a lot easier. I know some 60 plus people working at Google. So this is niche and company specific. Um, we're going to jump quickly to why do companies do this because we don't have really too many, too many arguments that they don't. So my goal is to make better matches, matches between your talents and desires and their needs. And you will find me to some extent a peacekeeper. You will not find me looking for the adversarial stance or let's get even or let's nuke them. Um, <laughs> you're going to find my musings, my observations, my ideas, some of which have been known to work, some of which have actually given people some hope. And then you are going to share your input, I hope, interactively during the presentation. Don't wait till the end. So that we can actually work out some workarounds. Um, suggestions that can work, things that definitely have worked, and in your experience, things that have not worked. All of these I want to hear about. This is a work in progress. Okay. So context, Northern California is expensive. Most local companies, at least in my niche, tech writing, want local workers. They want you there. Maybe they have an open seating plan and they'll notice if you're not there. Maybe they just tell you that they want the rapport and the synergy of having you there. And that's part of the job description. Result, qualified technology workers aren't cheap. Companies are capitalistic enterprises. They like it cheaper. Plus, they like leverage over the people they have hired. So this gets to the, why do they want to import them? Okay, we're going to get there later. Um, in terms of age, technology workers in the software industry are older if they're over 50, and they are definitely older if they are <coughs> north of 60. However, I know dozens of people in the latter category 
who are exceptionally effective at what they do and are working and proving it to their companies. And they've got some interesting perspectives that they've shared with me. Not completely, but some they've shared with me. Okay, most of us need to work until we're 65 till we can draw Social Security. I see a hand. Where did you get the number 65? 65. In the 21st century? Right. Uh, <laughs> thank you, touche. Um, these days is when you can draw Social Security max, you know. <laughs> but I know, you can't live on that. It, you're, good point, thank you. Okay. Typically, older technology workers have at least 10 years of industry experience. Some have three or four decades. Just so we're talking about those terms. If you're a newcomer to the business and you're older, that's not the person I'm addressing in this presentation. Most are subject matter experts first. You're in this business because you love the, the technology, the subject material. And you are what I've laughingly called a corporate citizen. Second, your diplomacy skills, your interpersonal skills, your ability to make peace and find solutions when confronted. Let's take a back seat to your ability to solve the problem, the technology problem. Okay? Do we have any challenges or does this rankle anybody? Yes? You, you can't interview for the second one, can you? Say again, please? Can you interview for corporate citizenship? <laughs> I've noticed that interviews are typically chemistry 50% of the time. So a corporate citizen, another less polite way to say that is somebody who will toe the corporate line, somebody who is tractable, somebody who is obedient, somebody who won't make the hiring manager look bad. Instead, is somebody who's interested in making the hiring manager look good. Just observation. Go ahead. So, so I have a couple reactions to this. One is about the years of industry experience. Okay. So technology moves so fast, it seems to me that more years of experience, at some point, you just kind of pass a curve and it's like, it's a detriment instead of an encouragement. It can be a curse. It just seems like, oh, you, you know a lot of stuff, which doesn't matter. Okay. Does everyone understand? Did everyone hear the observation? More years of the game is perhaps not better after a certain point? At some point, point yeah. It's, and, and it's quite accurate. If you make a point of saying, I've got more years, or showing you've got more years in the game. So this is an important and nuanced way to say, I've done more than you have, hiring manager or hiring organization. You, you've got to be gentle about it. The other thing is, uh, this idea that um, you're a corporate citizen second. Yep. Uh, I get the idea that maybe you're less amenable to being, you're less tractable and less willing to do anything. That's a concern of hiring managers, someone that's been around a while. But if you've uh, actually had 10 years experience instead of one year's experience 10 times, Maybe you have learned how to better be a better diplomat and how to get things done through other people. Exactly. Especially if you've ever been a manager. If you so have those skills. So those are skills that you might very well have learned and could apply that someone who's just out of college doesn't have. Okay, did everyone hear the comment? All right, so I agree that if you've got more than the same year of experience 10 times, but you've actually learned to leverage that through others, and maybe even lead or inspire or push teams, you're going to find me advocating that you use those latter skills rather than seeking to compete as an individual contributor. Um, but I'll, I will deal with that again in more detail as we go. Great. Well, maybe, maybe there, what, you could say superficially the, the unit for experience for years maybe a little bit more, a little bit more nuanced, it's, it's number of situations you've been in. Right. Number of technical situations you've been in, which generally has some correlation with, with the amount of time. Yep. But I, I don't think <coughs> that has a, uh, a shelf life to it. You don't which? I, I don't think the variety of situations has a shelf life to it. It, it doesn't it, unless you're dealing with an insecure hiring manager. And, and I, I think if you 
make it clear to a hiring manager that you that you are that you know more than they do, then that's a threat. And ultimately, they are hiring you to make them look good. It's that primitive. So knowing more than they do can be a wonderful asset to the team, the combined group. If you're sensitive and careful about introducing it. It's a cultural thing. And I completely understand why you wouldn't want to say, I tried that, I tried that 15 years ago, and here's why it didn't work, and I don't really think we should go down that path again because it's gonna be a bust. But you don't do that in a confrontational or even a public way. Um, you offer a better alternative. Anyway, th these are ways to win friends and influence people that will get you further as a more experienced professional. And will, be, even if you were on the other side of the desk from somebody like you, you might feel it difficult to resist competing. And if an older worker starts competing with a younger worker, I guarantee the older worker loses. This culture and this capitalistic market will cut your legs out from under you. It's not fair, it's fact. Yes? That's absolutely correct. And I, I have a friend, he's got tons of experience, but when I look at his resume, and when I start talking to him, trying to walk into him, he's a local disaster, but he starts talking about main I said, look, you don't have to work smart with anyone who's got a resume. Shut sure. up about the main thing. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about it. Can you do Django? No, I don't care if you, you know, if you're the smartest guy to the sea compiler in uh, NASA or wherever 20, right. 20 years ago. You start getting defensive. Oh, I'm right here, right now. You, you, you're echoing my point that, that some people will say, well, no, I don't know today's technology, and they get defensive right. that they're being asked. And I understand why they're being defensive, but I also understand that it's not a constructive stance, and it's very, very easy for a hiring manager to hear that and close down. No, for sure. But I'm also saying about the interview dynamic, the interview dynamic is shoved in this they got Yes. I, as I tell my nine-year-old, you have two ears and one mouth. Use them at least in proportion. Does it work? Does that work? It doesn't work with a nine-year-old yet. But there's hope springs eternal. Okay. So, <laughs> did I go in the right direction? Yes, I did. Um, okay, meanwhile... In the local software industry, we have lots of local 20 and 30-somethings specially trained to fill these jobs and not much else. They don't have your depth of experience. They have a very specific idea of where they want to work, what they want to do. It's mostly about stature. And they're not motivated to, well, rock the boat. And they're, especially in high-demand software development languages and technologies, they are custom fits, or they're pretty close to a custom fit. Older technology workers, not so much. However, you're smarter and more seasoned, and you can make yourself a good ally, if not a custom fit. Yes? I was going to say one way is not just compete against the local 20 to 30 somethings, but also those in India or China. Oh, yes. And a good way to compete with that is you know, getting vertical experience in industry X, industry Y, or, and then being able to transfer across industries. Also, train your technology and function, like technology and product management, or technology and yes. sales. You know, being, being a geek that can speak really makes you competitive over some of the others that are just. So, professional versatility, um, the ability to leverage 
other experiences. And, and related to that, to climb the value chain, to say, okay, I've done this in this industry, in that industry, I've got these sets of experience, I can, I can bridge, and I can go to a higher octave of those so that the team I influence gets better as a result without having to make the same kinds of mistakes again. Some very confident organizations like that idea. The majority lack the confidence, and that's a threat. Because ultimately, you will call them out and say, I told you so. That is suicide. That strategy is an expensive nightmare. Been there. I did that 20 years ago. Stop. You know, stop now. Think. Listen. Some of them won't. And they're better funded than you are. So, <laughs> okay. Um, so this is part of what I was alluding to, going up the value chain, for multidisciplinary skill combinations. For okay, in, in my selfish little world, uh, developers who can write, developers who can train, developers who can create bridges to other developers. Those are far fewer in number. And I can guarantee you the people that Facebook, LinkedIn, Google, and Amazon want to hire, they have no aspiration at all to do this kind of work. And I can also tell you as a recruiter for the industries that I serve, seriously lucrative. So they don't have the same label as the door you've been knocking on, but they will give you many, many, many of the same rewards. Okay. Excuse me. Yes. So far you've talked about software. Is okay. there any need for hard, uh, writers that are familiar with more on the hardware side? Okay, the question was about techno technical writers or technology writers in the hardware side. Mm -hmm. There is some demand, but it is a tiny fraction of the software development side of tech writing. Used to be a lot more when Silicon Valley had more of a hardware market. But most, in my experience, most of those jobs went offshore and won't come back. And the ones that didn't are much more, much geekier than most hardware writers that I've met can deal with. An exception is if you are also an illustrator, because if you can illustrate, if you can draw graphics, cutaways, three, the perspective pieces and so forth on hardware, you have, you have composite skills, you have a multi, multidisciplinary skill set, and that makes you two hires in one for some companies, but it's not a magic bullet by any means. So today, as far as I can tell, Engineers control budgets. Technology demands new skills that have different names that are, in most cases, evolutions of old skills or older skills. But it's very easy for someone to say, do you program in R? Do you program in Linda? Do you program in something else? And you say, no, but I program in three or four languages that, that was built on and still get no. So technology marches forward. If you are keeping current, then they don't have that against you. But they'll play that card first. Yes? Can you explain why you think engineers control budgets? Because I don't think I've ever been in a company where I've controlled the budget, I've given a budget. OK. You were given a budget that you were allowed to spend. I'm not saying that you determine how much you should have, but you do have control, almost unilateral control, over how it gets spent, whom, whom to hire, and what to sign up for. That, that's the kind of control that we're talking about. Um, contrast that with my community, the technical writing community, once, once upon a time was 
the technical publications manager had a budget and could decide on whom to spend that, <coughs> that might apply to three companies in Silicon Valley now. The budget for a technical publications initiative or activity is controlled by a CFO with buy-in from engineers. So it's a, it's a multi-layered hiring process. Yes, sir? Isn't your point actually that engineers have more power again? And that is... That is my point. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, um, you know, we don't want to get too much into power dynamics, but uh, the thing is, is that the number of people you have to please in the interviewing process is many fewer than it was in 2008. If that's true for you, wow, good. It's The opposite is true in my world, where... A candidate must not only please an engineer, but a marketing person, and a UX person, and a professional services, and a professional services person, thank you, and support, and a few others. So my world got more complex after the sky fell in 2001, and a lot more complex after 2008. If, if, if your decision makers or decision making layer consolidated, I'm sure that has its own challenges, but that's an easier, it's an easier game to win the, than the one I've been playing for a while. Anyone want to? Okay. Um, so you know who you are if you're a technology worker and you haven't stayed current with all the skills that the hiring managers at the jobs that you, are, you find interesting want to see on a resume. Um, hiring teams... And this is the biggest and most obvious point I'm trying to make this evening. Hiring teams seek peers with similar skills and values and work ethic. Culturally, they're looking for a clone. Yes? So values and work ethic, cultural, it seems like that might be very tied to age. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So, so this is where I get a little uh, more adventuresome, maybe... I won't call it libelous, but <laughs> those of us who are older have more lifestyle concerns and aren't trying to change the universe. Am I wrong? Okay. Um, at a certain point, you, stop, say, you, you go along to get along mostly. And you are interested in doing good work you are interested in not being fried by that experience, and you are interested in being valued, but you are not interested in changing the world. And that is, call it a personal belief, but I think that is what hiring teams know about us that scares them, because they can't really intimidate us anymore. <laughs> I'm us. I'm, I'm one of you. Um, it's, it makes for this cultural anxiety, this cross, this cultural, I won't call it a divide because that's a little too final, but it's a, it's a cultural disparity between older workers and younger corporate cultures. Go ahead. Could you explain a little bit about why it's important for younger people to scare the shit out of us? Power, <laughs> testosterone. It's a trip. It's ego. So they're getting 20 hours a day of work. Yeah, they have to kind of rationalize the fact that they've sold out completely. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know if you were in the industry at that age or if you ever met people who'd done that and respected them. But there are, I was one of them. I sold out. I worked for Oracle right after it went public. And it was, an ex it was a rocket rocket. It was an extraordinarily testosterone-soaked, um, self-validating ego trip. And I loved every solitary minute of it. And I worked seven days a week and 16 hours a day, and I couldn't get enough. And then they betrayed me. And I stopped wanting that for myself. And I started being a little more uh, circumspect about their agenda. But I know lots of people 
who get, still get off on that trip. So that's, if they make you feel small, it's because they think it's a zero-sum game. They're wrong, but they do. Ah, how interesting. That's a wonderful insight. They think it's their, they need to hire. Yep. And money appearing to tell them it's not a zero-sum game. And yet, in their own minds, it is a zero-sum game. Sure. They're competing with you. So the goal of this exercise, at least if you get to a phone interview or an in-person interview, is don't compete with them. Be their ally. If you scare them, and there are lots of ways to do that when you're insecure, um, I don't mean the candidate, I mean the hiring manager being insecure. Yeah, yeah. There are lots of ways to make them feel uncomfortable. If you do that, you lose. By hiring manager, do you mean the person that you'll most likely be working for if you get hired? I mean anybody on the hiring, the interviewing team, because they all have a vote, and often it's a consensus decision. So everybody can say, he's got all the right skills, she's got all the right everything, and I just want to hire that person. And someone says, but they looked at me cross-eyed. Or I hired someone like that once, and it didn't work out because. And everyone gets nervous. And everyone says, well, if we can't agree, we're going to keep on interviewing. And it gets ugly. I mean, it's a huge waste of time, and it's not rational. It's fear-driven. As a recruiter, I can tell you the very, very first concern hiring managers have is to cover their tails. They want defensibility. They want not to be able to say, oops, I made a bad hire. Now I have to back that out. It's a huge career-limiting move for them. Yes. So it's one way of lowering their risk to be a contingent worker, a okay. So the question, the question is working contract contingency, lower essentially a, a lower stature player. And yes, that is part of the answer. I, I will. I have a solutions page which I will cover that. Contract to staff, or even just contract, or even part of a consulting term that, team that is not even you know, doesn't even want to be affiliated with the organization. It's in to d deliver a solution and leave. All these can lower the intimidation factor. In fact, I've just spent three years working for a consulting team where we introduce consultants and we help define the project on which the consultant will work. And when those projects succeed, the client almost invariably turns around and says, is that person interested in being, you know, is?" That person interested in captivity, will they work for us? And very often the answer is, sign me up, as long as the options are good, or they, you know, or I can work at home, or I can... They've got much more negotiating power, much more leverage. Okay, so it doesn't really need to be said, but hiring teams value cultural compatibility much more than experience and wisdom. They are intimidated by the latter. So let's not intimidate them. Um, so hiring teams discriminate. And we all know some of the symptoms, but here are some. Here are just spelled out. Um, technical assessments, phone interviews go great. Face-to-face -face interviews turn sour. Ever had that happen to you? Yep, once or twice. Okay. Um, the hiring team realizes the candidate is a couple decades older than their average age, and they get anxious. Now, I'm not a lawyer. I don't play one on TV. But there are legal reasons for worrying about protected classes and so forth. I'm not going to go into that. I can't solve that. But I can solve some other, or I can suggest solutions to some other issues. Also, hiring team doesn't follow up with fully qualified candidates. It's too much experience. You're overqualified. Or it's you haven't worked for the right companies recently. Somebody else hasn't taken the chance on you recently. I'm not interested in taking the chance on you. It's the bias in favor of somebody who is working to come work for me versus somebody who is unemployed to come work for me. Yes? There's one other that you might want to add to your list. Try me. Um, it's the bogus interviews 
where they ask questions that are extra topical to the job at hand. Yep. Um, and of course, you're not prepared, so you fail. Uh, because they seem, your wisdom, your wisdom and experience says that has nothing to do with the job. Why would they ever ask me a question about that, right? And so what happens is then they fail you for not having skills that are not related to the job for which you failed in the interview. Are you, are you speaking about um, kind of those, those unanswerable questions like how many ping pong balls fit in the VW bus or how would you move Mount Fuji? Or Are these the kind of questions you're, you're speaking about? That is, that is the most extreme version of that class of interview. Okay. But it's quite possible to be not quite as extreme and still have nothing to do with the job okay. and still fail the candidate. All right, so, so that is what we in the hiring trade call a behavioral interview. And what they're looking for is partly compliance and partly versatility. So they, I don't want to take their side, but here's the way they argue this. They say, the person is unwilling to think on his or her feet. They are inflexible. They are, this is how it'll come down. And your job is to know that by not answering the question to the best of your ability with a smile on your face, you are challenging the fact that they are driving the interview. If you say, I don't see how that's relevant, you'd better have a good legal reason for doing that. Like, what is your marital status? What is your preference? Blah, blah, blah. These are all the legal questions. You can say, I don't see how that's relevant to my performance on the job. But if it's a a non-illegal question, if it's a legal question, this again is a power game. It is show me that you can think, you can twist yourself in a, in a little pretzel and think outside of the box I just put you in. Right. They want to see that because ultimately they don't want to worry that you can't think outside that box. Go ahead. Well, I think right. they, they, they want to see how you handle that type of situation yep. because they meet, the, they have those situations at work where, oh shit, what do I do with this? Yeah. Uh, how am I going to get myself out of this? We've got this weird problem or something. And so how do you think through yeah. the stupid question about the stupid scenario of how do you figure out whether the light is on or off if you only have two you know, if one light is on or one light, you know, yes. which one it is, and it's, there's no windows, and you can't tell. And, um, they want to see your reaction. Yep. Where, where the answer isn't obvious, and, and kind of inductive thinking is necessary. Um, the, the puzzle questions, they're... Some of them are designed to humiliate and embarrass. But others can be flipped around and said and, and answered constructively, helpfully, even interestingly. And they're going to remember a creative answer. Mm -hmm. But they're also going to slam down their, you know, they're, they're going to lock out somebody who says, you know, that's not my script. Mm -hmm. Because we don't, you know this. Nobody runs from scripts. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to distinguish between how many ping pong balls can you fit inside a, a, a bus. I mean, maybe that's a valid question to see just how you think about the problem. Mm -hmm. But the concept of behavioral interviews, how do you deal with people in situations you don't expect to? If you are a currently employed manager at a company that trains its managers to how to hire people, that's how you're trained to hire. That's part of your training right now. That is a very standard way of, of hiring people. Yep. How do you interact with people in certain situations when you don't know what to do or what the answer is or how they're going to behave? Especially in jobs where you need to interact with a bunch of people. So There's no right answer. I, I, I think you... But you should, you should expect questions like that. That's how... I, 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 think it, I, I think those are the norm. I completely agree. And they, they are trying to put you off balance. The entire intent is to go off script and to see how you think. Because real life's that way. Yeah. Because real life is that way. And if you don't have a pat answer, they're going to find you more credible. Show some effort in answering that rather than 
well, you didn't ask, ask me, but I figured out how I'm going to move Mount Fuji, so I'll tell you how I'm going to move. That's not going to impress them. What's going to impress them is your responsiveness, your willingness to think through a situation, and your willingness to articulate your thought pattern. If they find flaws with your thought pattern, that's their business, and maybe they don't offer you the job. But I don't think it's designed to say, you're not good enough, because you didn't answer a certain question a certain way. OK. Any other questions, comments? OK. All right, so let's get to the meat of what concerns a hiring team. The older candidate isn't culturally compatible with open seating, Red Bull and vodka or pub crawls after work, Nerf Wars, snowboarding weekends, fill in your favorite youth-oriented event or series of events, and you're not going to argue with that. That's not my thing. I want to get home to my partner. I want to go home and mow the lawn. I want to, I want to walk my pet. I'm not a single you know, person who lives at work. Okay, fair enough. The older candidate is not going to enjoy working weekends or doing all-nighters. Okay, also true, not something you have to advertise, but you can be calm and firm about resisting the invitation to do those things. Okay, the older candidate is going to get sick more often. That's going to increase our health, care, the, our health insurance costs. It's going to cause legal trouble if the hiring team has to lay the older candidate off. Well, it's true. Older workers do skew costs of group health insurance. Sorry, it's true. And it is true that there are protected classes over certain ages, um, pregnancy status, um, gosh, half a dozen others. I don't care to, to go get specific, but basically the government looks at that and says, gee, this person has been discriminated against based on age. Companies are thinking to themselves, if this person doesn't work out and we have to lay them off, we're under scrutiny. We don't want lawyers involved. Okay, finally, the older candidate will not be tolerant of the hiring team's chaos, their refusal to do to freeze the GUI, their refusal to plan or schedule anything real, um, and more. They won't, they won't fail fast, necessarily. They'll want to do it right the first time. Amazing, imagine that. Um, the older candidate will advocate for technology or tools that she or he knows better, knows can do the job, won't worry about will this tool or the technology Will this strategy cohere? Um, the older candidate won't be truly agile or wear more than one hat when necessary. They won't turn from developer into marketeer or technical support or UX guru when there's an opportunity for them to do so. Well, that's okay. But gee, those skills would be nice. And if you want to do those kinds of things and say so, you increase your marketability. Finally, the older candidate will be reluctant to commute or work on site. Well, this applies to technical writers. Does it apply to software developers? Do you guys care whether you work on site? You do. How about others? Do you, do you like commuting? It's nice to have the flexibility. Okay. Do we mean our flexibility, like working hours flexibility, or do we mean, it's, it's nice gee, I won't take a job if I don't? Okay. It's nice to have that flexibility. Okay, and is that something that you want scheduled in, as in every Friday I work from home and every Tuesday I work from home too? Is that, is that, is that the norm for the kinds of jobs that you guys are looking for? I think it depends on the distance you have to travel to get to work. Okay. If you're traveling 40 miles. So you want them tolerant of the commute hassle? Yeah, it's not age specific. If you're living 40 miles away from your work, right. you don't work. Okay. Do we have agreement on that? If, you, if you're 40 miles out 
and they they prove themselves inflexible on your being on site. You know, ten to six. That's a problem. Okay. It could be, yeah, it could very much be a problem because I know people uh, in my company who live in Tracy. Yikes. Um, and he's and he's on the IT team, so they have kind of a different way of working their schedule and hours right. and being on site and off site anyway. Yep. But um, you know, if you've got to drive two hours, and in fact, there's somebody who lives in Ramon, one of the developers, and. He comes in around 11-ish, 12-ish, yeah. sometimes not until 2-ish. San Ramon? Because San Ramon, yeah. San Ramon. You said Ramon. San Ramon. San Ramon. Yes, thank you. Um, and so, yeah, it can be a deal breaker. But, okay. you know, any job is going to have... Um, Challenges. I mean, if that's something, that's something right. you, you establish. If you, if you have an 8 a.m. scrum, get over it, yeah. Or, 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 or call in. Right. Yes? Uh, I have a so, comment about the legal issue. Okay. I don't get why companies are so worried about it because they don't tell you why they're, they're laying you off. I mean, I had, besides my age, I probably had two other reasons for being uh, laid off, but they just say business business reasons. They're not going to tell you why they're laying you off. So how can you prove that they laid, laid you off because... If more than one person was laid off... Um, it doesn't work that way. I, 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 I've been on the other end of that. I fired someone who was in a protected class. Uh -huh. Had all the documentation. They did a terrible job for several years. They read multiple well, that's counseling sessions. That's a different and, Wait, wait, wait. wait. <coughs> and so after I fired them, they hired an attorney and said, we're suing. You fired me because of my class. And I had a long conversation with our attorney and said, OK, uh, we can't win except by losing. So we're going to pay whatever. We're going to make a settlement with this person. That's the only way. Because if we go to trial, we might win, we might lose. But if we go to trial, it costs us still more money. And by the way, the settlement comes out of your budget. <laughs> it's just, it's just, you cannot win. Well, if, if you, if you, you may be wrong, but you can't win. If, if you had gonna, three years of warnings, that's, that's a different that. case. But they brought me into the office right. seven years after I'd worked there. They sat me down and said, "We're laying you off for business reasons." Now, there's no documentation trail whatsoever that would prove any of that stuff you talked about. And my guess is that it's my situation a lot more often than your situation. I'd like to propose that that topic is outside the scope. Yeah, it, it's a little bit outside the, the, the range of ageism because we can't prove. <laughs> we, can't, we can't prove it, but we can work around it. So let's get to the workarounds here. OK. Um, finally, the, 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 or, the older candidate is feared because of this, this age and treachery thing. Like, we know they're smarter. We know they've, been, they've seen more. We know that they've got workarounds. We know that they've got friends who've been here. They're going to turn adversarial if things go wrong. So can anyone else think of other reasons that older candidates are culturally at odds with would-be employers? Yes. Hello. Uh, um, we only hire people who are capable of innovation, which is not possible for anyone over 35. Wow. <laughs> Have you heard that? <laughs> that was uh, the uh, CEO of, the last CEO of Sun had an all hands meeting right before work with the Goldberg, and that's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Oops. <laughs> Did he have a job after the acquisition? I guess Larry does the same. Yeah. Okay. I also sat in a room with 200, 300 people like this uh, with a panel of HR people, and I heard uh, the HR director for Intel say, uh, um, and this is a paraphrase, part of my job is to uh, keep from candidates who are not competitive from wasting the time of our hiring managers, for instance, those over 35. Oops. I wish you'd take that because you'd have a lawsuit. Anyway. Um, so I'm going to jump into what I consider, consider are some solutions or ways toward the, they're the beginnings of solutions. 
for the ages and problems that we're encountering. Sorry, before I do so, Greg, did you want? Preemptively anticipating the hiring team's concerns and addressing them before they even bring them up. Hey, if I were you, I'd be feeling anxiety about my efficiency. Let me tell you how my experience has made me more efficient. If you give them examples without it being a pissing contest, without making anyone defensive, you can win the day with this alone. So, if you are willing in a non-adversarial fashion to share with, as an older candidate, to share with the hiring team or with your hiring manager <coughs> your sense of what works and why, or what the users for this product or service need, or the easiest way to achieve goals, and my agenda is to make you hiring manager or leader or whatever look good, and you are authentic about that agenda, then good things happen. They start looking at you as an ally, as somebody who wants to help. Quality. I don't really think this needs to be discussed, but basically you've done it. You've reached higher standards than most of them ever aspire to. Focus. You can tune out crap, and you can get stuff done where it'll do most good. So you're most likely to get across the finish line faster and with fewer scars. That may not make you a hero to a martyr, but it'll make you a hero to a team that cares about results. Pacing. You are not reluctant. You are, excuse me, you are reluctant to fry on your way to the finish line, but you can show them and volunteer how you work steadily and sanely and get stuff done over the long term as well as for the next sprint and so forth. You are all about meeting commitments. You are not about show. Okay. And then there's the issue of self-awareness. to find it any way you want, but you know yourself. You know your strengths and weaknesses. You know what not to take on. You know when to seek help or delegate you aren't motivated to blame. This is not a power game for you. And if you can convince them that it's not a power game, that you don't mind not only sharing but giving the credit away, better things happen. Is any of this resonating with you folks? Mm -hmm. Does this like does this give anybody hope? Well, it makes me it makes me think of uh, in an interview saying I can help. I might be able to help with that. Uh -huh. So instead of saying, well, yes, I've done this and this, and this is the way we did it, and so I would think that that's what I would do here. Yep. No, I, I'm just here to help. I'm here to offer. Um, I, I might, uh, you know, I have a reflection on that, that, you know, would this kind of thing work? And, yep. But you take a much um, more subdued approach. I like that, yep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, candor, frankness, this is where you and your realistic, your understanding of your own limitations can lead the team not to become a train wreck. You could say these things are likely possible for me, but the following risks I know will, will occur. And as long as we're covered, as long as you're willing to address these risks, we as a team, with me on it, can be much more successful. But let's call a spade a spade. This is a risk. This, I've been there before, and I don't have a solution. So maybe you do, great. Let's head in that direction. But the candor there, the vulnerability, is a source of extreme strength. A lot of people do not acknowledge that a candidate who knows where they are weak is a good investment. Yes? Sure. They might have a day better week, whatever, get reset 29 times, and everything is noted, and you don't want to call bullshit on that. So you, want, you only want to have, you know, be totally acceptable, that's what candor. 
you are correct. You, you don't want to go too far overboard on the candor. And there are lots of companies that will pretend they have no weaknesses. I worked for one of them called Oracle. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so to a point, but you don't want to get yourself into a situation where you're going to be a martyr. Like, hey, you say that you could manage projects with 100 people on it and would distribute it across the planet, and you can't, then that's kind of suicide. You've, created, you've put your own neck in the noose. Right. Okay. So I, I think we agree. We'll, we'll be reasonable about that. But a touch of vulnerability is a source of amazing strength and it builds trust. Well, conversely, I mean, there are, I can name half of the companies where such a vulnerability is suicide. You don't want to do it. Okay. So I'm saying it's all happening in All right. I'll, I'll defer to you if, if you know the cultures you're interviewing with much better than I. I Well, that's, that is a given. You do need to do your homework. I would suggest looking at the LinkedIn profiles and maybe doing some Google searches on the people that you know will interview you, interview you and make sure that you've got something interesting to talk about and maybe you've got some rapport to build outside of their questions. Okay. Um, so your clarity, the clear, setting clear expectations and delivering on those, that is an asset that younger, less experienced workers can never claim. And mentoring, some people actually like the concept of a mentor who won't undermine me, but will make the team stronger. So play that card. If you feel like being a mentor. If you feel like going home, don't. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about some ways around what most of you probably imagine is a brick wall. But before I do that, I'd like to hear from you about your success stories. How have you resolved some of these challenges that we've been discussing, I've been talking about? Anybody want to lead? Go ahead, Anna. Um, I would think that uh, working on a project basis would be more popular than it is. I've tried that for some years, and it's worked amazingly well in a few cases. And But I, I would think that hiring managers might be more interested in hiring older workers on a project basis. You know, it's a short thing. You don't have to worry about all the cultural stuff. They can still do the mentoring and all that kind of thing. And yet, it's not as popular as I would like it to be both for myself and, and because I think that, that uh, some of the hiring managers are kind of missing a bet on that. Why do you, have you found companies that are willing to do that and how do you think that is as a solution? So sorry. I found, for three years, I found lots of companies interested in project-based services. Those were the, the main offerings of, of the consultancy that I worked for. But it got harder and harder to say, we will solve your problem and then leave. Um, in, the, in the terrain in which you operate, in, in data implementations, for example, it's not a quick come in, do it, and leave. It's, it's a cultural shift, and it's a long-term migration of lots of legacy technical writing documents to a different format. It's something that, in my experience, companies are much more reluctant to hire an outsider for because they know this is a multi-year transition. And if they don't own it, if they don't understand what they did, when you leave, it's messy. So in your niche, I've seen reluctance to commit to project-based workers but in other areas, like write, write me an API reference documentation, really very, very happy to bring in a, an external resource, get gone. Were you trying to get my attention? Say, 
while you were asking about stories, and I Good. had one to tell. Wonderful, please, sir. So, I'm, you know, I certainly run into the idea of, um, do you know the current technology? And uh, so I, I'm involved in something right now that feels successful, uh, where a friend of mine and I were starting to study a particular type of technology called OpenStack. And he looked on Craigslist and found someone who was looking for expertise in that. And it turned out that the people on Craigslist are a startup, I mean a super early stage startup. So we're now part of a virtual team that's doing this technology. We're using uh, OpenStack on Rackspace and uh, they're going to put up a, one of the guys that's putting up a Jenkins server, which I've never dealt with Jenkins. He says it's for continuous integration. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be working with all these things and learning all these things, and I'll be able now to go on to other things and say, hey, look what I've done just now. That was part of the idea behind him looking at uh, Craigslist was, in addition to studying the technology, we wanted to be able to say, we've actually used it on a project, right? Because people don't want education. They want experience, that, and actually, right? Uh, that's my that's my experience is that they don't want education; they want you to use the stuff. Now it feels successful to me because we're doing things with technology, we're making things work. But I have to say, like I say, it's a very early stage startup, so there's no money. Okay, uh, but but it still feels successful and it feels like a good step forward. One other thing I want to mention is that um, in a different context, a friend of mine had put my name forward for a, uh, an interview with com his company. I went there, I interviewed. It seemed to be okay with the engineer, but I, uh, the engineers, but I interviewed with the, um, the vice president and I heard later on uh, that my friend heard that it was because I couldn't learn fast enough. That was total perception on their part, right? There was no evidence of this whatsoever. Now, an interesting thing, though, that you, that you might want to keep in mind is, he later told me, hey, um, they're thinking they made a mistake. They couldn't find people with the right background. And I did have the right background, right? So consider, if you have that kind of experience happen to you, Consider going back later or get to talk to your contact later and say, whatever happened with that? Something like that. Okay. Very nice. <clears throat> Love that. Thank you. One, one, one thing that, that's worked for me at, at times is, is, is flexibility. Okay. In, in that I, I, I have much less ego in terms of I have to be working on something, you know, on a specific thing, and I'm much more willing to pitch in and just do whatever needs to be doing and help the team out. Wonderful. You earn a lot of loyalty and trust that way. Brilliant. Well done. Thank you. Others? Uh, so I kind of have a question, but I wanted to sort of couch it um, in some stories as well. First of all, um, uh, just a small one. I saw an ad for a, someplace I was looking for. They called it a rock star developer. <laughs> and. Uh, I applied for it, we went through everything, seems like a good fit. Then he asked me how much money I'm making. I tell him, he says, oh, there's no way we're gonna hire you. And I'm thinking, oh, you asked for a rock star, you know, but you don't wanna pay rock stars. <laughs> um, and uh, I wanted to address, so my overall question is, um, if you're gonna talk about salary, because I think older people generally are making more money, um, I get asked very often, how much are you making right now? Um, and uh, it's definitely been a showstopper when uh, I come right out and say it. I usually just say, let's talk about it later if we see it as a good fit. And that's generally worked a lot better. I was wondering if you had any other pointers or things that you talk about in regards to talking about the whole salary issue. Lots. I, I can do entire <laughs> conversations about compensation. Um, if the issue is the client doesn't know what the services cost, ask 
to have a dialogue about it and give a range. If you are cornered into a number, give a range. Um, depending on the nature of the project, its length, the, bre the breadth of responsibilities I have, my rate has ranged from X to Y, where there might be a $50 an hour difference. You so, can give them something to, ch to chew on with that without scaring them away. Uh, as somebody's recruiter, if I am representing that candidate to a client, I'll say, don't answer the question. I want to call my lawyer, I mean my, my recruiter, <laughs> and, and talk about that with Andrew. And I love to negotiate. I just, it, it flips my switches um, because I've got an interested client and I've got a motivated candidate and I can make a marriage. But if you're on the hot seat and it's all about price, can we afford this person? You need not to just sell price. You need to sell a solution. So if you want to say, I cost $200 an hour, but I'll have it done by Friday, that's a totally different conversation from, oh, and I'll be coming back for more in three months. So if you just sell on price, your experience is going to make them scared. But if you sell on competence, overall solutions, support, breadth of services, and so forth, you can make whatever price you, saw, you cite sound like a deal. Value price. Thank you. Hey. Uh, Actually, relating to pay here, I, uh, on our, our ACM uh, website, uh, I've tweeted a lot of articles on ageism, but one was a, a little cartoon that said, uh, we're looking for someone with the wisdom of a 50-year-old, the experience of a 40-year-old, the drive of a 30-year-old, and the pay scale of a 20-year-old. <laughs> and I can't argue with that at all. Second. Who, who's obligated to work for us for five years on a visa? Yeah. yeah. I mean, get it. Yes? Uh, sort of related to that. I've been, every, every application seems to be online. Okay. Some of them make a required answer, your price range. <clears throat> Many of them, I'd say over half, have some way of finding out how old you are, not by asking your age, but by asking when did you graduate from college, okay. or when did this happen or that happen, and you can backtrack and be pretty close to what the person's age is likely to be. Yep. That to me is the same thing as ageism. It's, I it's asking an illegal question, but they get around it. Is there any okay. way to handle those? Yes. Four letter word. Huh? Call. Call. Call me. Oh. <laughs> Sometimes that's not a choice. Maybe it's not. Leave it empty, or if, if that's not a, not a choice, you call them and say, this is a conversation that, for reasons I'm sure you can understand, I would like to have face-to-face. -face. But then they're not going to even call you for an interview. Did you want to work there? Yes. Frankly, <laughs> unless it's a really neat-sounding job, most likely not. Because okay. if, they're, if so, they're being dishonest, I don't want to work. I, I know this is going to sound like a radical and nasty and countercultural idea, but there are whispers for all of these hints that we're all getting that we can't do what a 20 or a 30 year old is perceived to be able to do. We need to do something different. We are not 20 and 30 year olds. We are in many ways better. We are in most ways smarter and more effective. However, we scare them. So we need to find our, we need to package ourselves differently. So I am going to cover a couple more of those solutions after this gentleman speaks. Just a quick observation. Go ahead, you, you, two gentlemen speak, go ahead. You, you go first. Observation of high salaries, the opposite has to be where if you're too low or too cheap, your credibility is on the line. So you need to have a balance in your salary, not too high, not too low, because I came out of a recent seminar today in Burlingame, you say that people who pay, pay attention. So if you go in 
something too cheap, it won't take you seriously as a good engineer to think you're not worth it. I couldn't agree more. I, I, don't, think it, I don't think the solution is to underprice yourself, and I haven't said that. I, I don't want you to underprice. I want you to look beyond the dollar cost, or help them look beyond the dollar cost of your services. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, you know, to the questions about online form filling and that sort of stuff, and by the time something, this is the same thing Nick Corkadee was looking at, and Andrew and I said, by the time something hits the job board or the web post, and you are, there are at least 10,000 people competing, so the trick is to, you know, go to where the, the hiring happens, because the, you know, word of mouth and network sourcing or even hackathons, things like that, that's how the quality hiring gets done these days. It's not job that. So go to Hackathon, set up your GitHub, submit the open source project, do all these things that you can do that cost nothing. Go to Hackathon, do the free pieces, they can free here, learn, learn the shitty API, write an app. There's a much better way of making these contacts than passively replying to stuff that got advertised in Vice that got posted online. Okay. So I didn't hear every word of that, but I, I don't, what I, what I did hear, yes, I, I don't disagree. What I'm saying is that basically the, the, the mode where people post an ad and you can argue that by the time a job is posted, yes, your odds of getting interviewed are... are it's actually already been filled. Uh, you, you can argue that it's already been filled or that they have allowed themselves to be cornered into defining a hybrid that either doesn't exist or that you will never match up to. And I don't really disagree with that either. I try very, very hard to get to clients before they've posted a job. Or I get to clients after they've posted that job for three months and they've had no takers and they've wasted a lot of time and I can educate them as to why that ad was self-destructive. And I can help them prioritize their needs and actually get the right person in there. But you're right, if you apply for a fresh lead as an older worker, as somebody who might represent a challenge, interpersonally, politically, otherwise, to an organization, they're going to wait till they get a better fit and you'll be forgotten. Right, so now in terms of the whole job hunting thing, what is that they go to where hiring actually happens these days? Get off the old town? Yeah. And your, your point is, but where hiring happens, do you mean physically located? Go to, um, hiring happens through networking and hackathons, open source events. Correct. Stuff. You are correct. It happens through networks. It happens, again, with the, the CYA motivation. I want to cover my tail. Or even LinkedIn. Or LinkedIn. LinkedIn can be very helpful, but only when you've actually got valid connections that care. If you are just applying to a job through LinkedIn and you're sending a resume to a recruiter through LinkedIn or sending your profile, can be as that is the job boards as much of a black hole. No contest. No, not applying to jobs on LinkedIn, getting sourced. Get, getting connections who can, who can speak, speak on your behalf yeah. at a particular company. Agreed. Okay. Um, so I'm going to add a few variations on <clears throat> some of the success story themes that we've heard. Um, the first, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, going up the value chain, take your core skills and reconsider that you, are, you can be more than an individual contributor. You can do, because of your experience, a broader job. So you've been a software developer all your life, you love to fit, solve problems, but you also have interpersonal skills and you could be a project manager, you could be a team lead, you could be tech support. You could be a trainer. Can I tell you how hard it is to find technical people who want to train and how stratospheric their compensation is? Unbelievable. Yes, there might be a little travel involved. Might not be. But technology training with, techno with technology skills, awesome. Undiscovered country. That's one. 
basically moving up the value chain, doing the work that the 20 and 30 somethings don't know exists or don't want because, wow, I wasn't trained for it in engineering school. The second is the, the sense that excuse me, um, hiding behind the, a younger face, if it is the color of your hair or the lack of it that scares the hiring team, get a colleague who's got marketing skills that could be part of a consulting team. It could be a friend who knows you to go in and speak for your services. You are pulling the strings. You are telling that person what to commit to and what not to commit to. You are doing the work. But that pretty face is flattering their self-image and getting the purchase order. And in many, many cases, they know it. And they see you doing the work, and you do it on a consulting basis, and it's good. And they say, OK, we tried before we buy or bought. Want to come captive? Want to sign up? Want to be one of us? Because we've already seen the nature of your work. We like it. You have passed muster. So that's the consulting world. And it doesn't have to be through a formal consultancy. I can tell you, consultancies get their pounds of flesh. If you have friends who can instead bring you in on a, you know, not a pro bono basis necessarily, but a, it gets you in the door, a, a way that gets you in the door where you are helping and you are also dismissible if things don't work out, they like that. They like that a lot. And then this is not the last, but the, the, the next big one. And that is pair your skills with other complementary skills. Um, and I'll talk about a very frequent scenario in my world. I am asked to find software engineers who can write documentation. Now, most technical writers have English degrees. They are really proud of their ability to craft sentences, organize information, learn quickly, and communicate with an audience. But the audience they communicate with is not a software developer for the most part. It's a person like them who might have system or network administration skills or might be a business user and need to know which radio button to click on the GUI. If you want to be the star of the show, find yourself a tech writer partner and make that tech writer partner look exceptionally good and exceptionally valuable by creating code samples, by saying, actually, the user of this documentation, this audience, this developer audience, already knows what you were about to tell them. Don't write that. Write this. This is what they really care about. And this is how to get through to them. I, representative of that audience, can speak with authority about what needs to be in this book. And I can keystroke test your code examples. And I will make sure that it coheres. I will make sure that you don't put your foot in your mouth. You do the writing, you do the publishing, and I will be the technical brain. A pair up like that could clean up at two dozen clients that I could name today. So there's hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, and it sounds like there's more variety, really. There's a ton more variety. If, if you want to stop being adversarial about it. Now, before this meeting, I, I met with a member of your organization um, who had very strong opinions about what is about to happen because of this cultural chasm between software developers and 
of, of an older variety and the hiring organizations today. And he said, well, you know, we are this close from those software people who do not get hired talking to pirates, not pirates, but crackers and others who, who can bring those companies' products to their knees or destroy those products or discredit their founders or do a whole bunch of really nasty, adversarial, ugly things. And I get the motivation behind that. It is very frustrating to not be able to join a team that you know you are worthy of. However, doing the adversarial thing isn't necessarily going to do much for your career. It might do favors for your ego temporarily, but I honestly don't think that's the way forward. Certainly not for the profession. It's going to make them more scared. It's going to give them more ammo for excluding those who don't look like them and think like them. So let's please not go there. Okay, so just a summary of techniques. Most of these have been covered already. Um, you anticipate these concerns. You address them preemptively and in detail. You show that you've kept current with technology, you are just as productive. You're on their wavelength. You characterize the hiring team's goals, discuss how you've achieved them in similar contexts. You say, I've been there, I've done that. Not, I know more than you do. Not, trust me, don't trust yourselves. But make your background a complementary an asset to them and make it clear that you want to make them look good. And share relevant proof, whatever that is, testimonials, references. Um, the gentleman who spoke earlier, um, who had worked on the um, OpenStack project, I was about to chime in and then forgot to, that the best takeaway from that project is likely the reference or references he got from a company, albeit in stealth mode, that's doing cool technology where he was a pivotal member of the team. There he is. Um, so I will take questions. I will be the last person to leave the room. Thank you.